Chapter 1 Dear Teresa, I'm lying on my bed tonight, missing you. My eyes all swollen, hot tears running down my face. There's a fierce summer lightning storm raging outside. Tonight, I walk down the streets, looking for you in every woman's face, as I have each night of this lonely exile. I'm afraid I'll never see your laughing, teasing eyes again. I had coffee in Greenwich Village earlier with a woman. A mutual friend fixed us up. Sure, we'd have a lot in common, since we're both into politics. Well, we sat in a coffee shop, and she talked about democratic politics, and seminars, and photography, and problems with her co-op, and how she's opposed to rent control. Small wonder, Daddy is a real estate developer. I was looking at her while she was talking thinking to myself that I'm a stranger in this woman's eyes. She's looking at me, but she doesn't see me. Then she finally said how she hates the society and what it's done to women like me, who hate themselves so much they have to act like men. I felt myself getting flushed, and my face twitched a little. And I started telling her, all cool and calm, about how women like me existed since the dawn of time, before there was oppression, and how those societies respected them. And she got her very interested expression on. And besides, it was time to leave. So we walked by a corner where these cops were laying into a homeless man. And I stopped and mouthed off to the cops, and they started coming at me with their clubs raised, and she tugged my belt to pull me back. I just looked at her, and suddenly I felt things well up in me I thought I had buried. I stood there, remembering you, like I didn't see the cops about to hit me. I was falling back into another world, a place I wanted to go again. And suddenly, my heart hurt so bad, and I realized just how long it's been since my heart felt anything. I need to go home to you tonight, Teresa. I can't, so I'm writing you this letter. I remember years ago, the day I started working at the cannery in Buffalo, and you had already been there a few months, and how your eyes caught mine and played with me before you set me free. I was supposed to be following the foreman to fill out some forms, but I was so busy wondering what color your hair was under that white paper net, and how it would look and feel in my fingers, down, loose, and free. And I remember how you laughed gently when the foreman came back and said, you coming or not? All us he she's were mad as hell when we heard you got fired because you wouldn't let the superintendent touch your breasts. I still unloaded the docks for another couple of days, but I was kind of mopey. It just wasn't the same after your light went out. I couldn't believe it that night I went to the club on the west side. There you were leaning up against the bar, your jeans too tight for words, and your hair, your hair all loose and free. And I remember that look in your eyes again. You didn't just know me. You liked what you saw. And this time, oh, woman, we were on our own turf. I could move the way you wanted me to, and I was glad I'd gotten all dressed up. Our own turf. Would you dance with me? You didn't say yes or no. Just tug, just teased me with your eyes, straightened my tie, smoothed my collar, and took me by the hand. 
You had my heart before you moved against me like you did. Tammy was singing, Stand by your man. And we were changing all the he's to she's inside our heads to make it fit right. After you moved that way, you had more than my heart. You made me ache, and you liked that. So did I. The older butches warned me. If you want to keep your marriage, don't go to the bars. But I've always been a one-woman butch. Besides, this was our community. The only one we belonged to. So we went every weekend. There were two kinds of fights in the bars. Most weekends had one kind or the other. Some weekends, both. There were the fist fights between the butch women, full of booze, shame, jealous insecurity. Sometimes the fights were awful and spread like a web to trap everyone in the bar. Like the night Hetty lost her eye when she got hit upside the head with a bar stool. I was real proud that in all those years I never hit another butch woman. See, I loved them too, and I understood their pain and their shame because I was so like them. I loved the lines etched into their faces and hands and the curves of their work weary shoulders. Sometimes I looked in the mirror and wondered what I would look like when I was their age. Now I know. In their own way, they loved me too. They protected me because I they knew I wasn't a Saturday night butch. The weekend butches were scared of me because I was a stone he she. If only they had known how powerless I really felt inside. But the older butches, they knew the whole road that lay ahead of me, and they wished I didn't have to go down it because it hurt so much. When I came to the bar in drag, kind of hunched over, they told me, be proud of what you are. And then they'd adjust my tie, sort of like you did. I was like them. They knew I didn't have a choice. So I never fought them with my fists. We clapped each other on the back in the bars and watched each other's back in the factories. But. Then there were the times our real enemies came in the door, front door. Drunken gangs of sailors, clan-type thugs, sociopaths, and cops. You always knew when they walked in because someone thought to pull the plug on the jukebox. No matter how many times it happened, we all went, Ah. When the music stopped and then realized that it was time to get down to business, when the bigots came in, it was time to fight. And fight we did. Fought hard. Femme and butch, woman and man together. If the music stopped, and it was the cops at the door, someone plugged the music back in, and we switched dance partners. Us in our suits and ties paired off with our drag queen sisters in their dresses and pumps. Hard to remember that it was illegal then for two women or two men to sway to music together. When the music ended, the butches bowed, our femme partners curtsied, and we returned to our seats, our lovers, and our drinks to await our fates. That's when I remember your hand on my belt, up under my suit jacket. That's where your hand stayed the whole time the cops were there. Take it easy, honey. Stay with me, baby. Cool off. You'd be cooing in my ear like a special lover's song sung to warriors who need to pick and choose their battles in order to survive. We learned fast that the cops always pulled the police van right up to the back door and left snarling dogs inside so we couldn't get out. We were trapped all right. 
Remember the night you stayed home with me, and I was so sick. That was the night, you remember. The cops picked out one of the most stone butch of them all to destroy and humiliate. A woman, everyone said, wore a raincoat in the shower. We heard they stripped her, slow, in front of everyone in the bar, and laughed at her trying to cover up her nakedness. Later, she went mad, they say. Later, she hung herself. What would I have done if I had been there that night? I remember the bus and the bars in Canada packed in the police vans. All the Saturday night butches giggled and tried to fluff up their hair and switch clothing so they wouldn't get thrown in it. So they could get thrown in the tank with the femme women. Said it would be like dying and going to heaven. The law said we had to be wearing three pieces of women's clothing. We never switched clothing. Neither did our drag queen sisters. We knew and so did you, what was coming. We needed our sleeves rolled up, our hair slicked back, in order to live through it. Our hands were cuffed tightly behind our backs. Yours were cuffed in front. You loosened my tie, unbuttoned my collar, and touched my face. I saw the pain and the fear for me in your face, and I whispered it would be all right. We knew it wouldn't be. I never told you what they did to us down there. Queens in one tank, stone butches in the next. But you knew. One at a time, they would drag our brothers out of the cells, slapping and punching them, locking the bars behind them in case we lost control and tried to stop them, as if we could. They'd handcuff a brother's wrist to his ankles or chain his face against the bars. They made us watch. Sometimes we'd catch the eye of the terrorized victim or the soon-to-be caught in the vice of torture. And we'd say gently, I'm with you, honey. Look at me. It's okay. We'll take you home. We never cried in front of the cops. We knew we were next. The next time the cell door opens, it'll be me they drag out in chains spread eagle to the bar. Did I survive? I guess I did. But only because I knew I might get home to you. They let us out last, one at a time, on Monday morning. No charges, too late to call, sick to work. No money, hitchhiking, crossing the border on foot, rumpled clothes, bloody, needing a shower, hurt, scared. I knew you'd be home if I could just get there. You ran a bath for me with sweet smelling bubbles. You laid out a fresh pair of white BVDs and a t-shirt for me and left me alone to wash off the first layer of shame. I remember it was always the same. I would put on the briefs, and then I'd get the t-shirt over my head, and you would find some reason to come into the bathroom, to get something or put something away. In a glance, you would memorize the wounds on my body like a road map. The gashes, the bruises, cigarette burns. Later in bed, you held me gently, caressing me everywhere, the tenderest touches reserved for the places I was hurt, knowing each and every sore place, inside and out. You didn't flirt with me right away, knowing I wasn't confident enough to feel sexy. But slowly, you coaxed my pride back out again by showing me how much you wanted me. You knew it would take you weeks again to melt the stone. Lately, I've read these stories by women who are so angry with their stone lovers, even mocking their passions when they finally give way to trust, to being touched. 
and I'm wondering. Did it hurt you the times I couldn't let you touch me? I hope it didn't. You never showed it if it did. I think you knew it wasn't you I was keeping myself safe from. You treated my stone self as a wound that needed loving, healing. Thank you. No one's ever done that since. If you were here tonight, well, it's hypothetical, isn't it? <laughs> I never said these things to you. Tonight, I remember the time I got busted alone on strange turf. You're probably wincing already, but I have to say this to you. It was the night we drove 90 miles to a bar to meet friends who never showed up. When the police raided the club, we were alone. And the cop with gold bars on his uniform came right over to me and told me to stand up. No wonder I was the only he, she in the place that night. He put his hands all over me, pulled up the band of my jockeys, and told his men to cuff me. I didn't have three pieces of women's clothing on. I wanted to fight right then and there because I knew the chance would be lost in a moment. But I also knew that everyone would be beaten that night if I fought back. So I just stood there. I saw they had you pinned, your arms behind your back, and, your, and cuffed your hands. One cop had his arm across your throat. I remember the look in your eyes. It hurts me even now. They cuffed my hands so tight behind my back, I almost cried out. Then, the cop unzipped his pants real slow, with a smirk on his face, and ordered me down to my knees. First, I thought to myself, I can't. Then, I said out loud to myself, and to you, and to him, I won't. I never told you this before, but something changed inside of me at that moment. I learned the difference between what I can't do and what I refuse to do. I paid the price for that lesson. Do I have to tell you every detail? Of course not. When I got out of the tank the next morning, you were there. You bailed me out. No charges. They just kept your money. You had waited all night long in that police station. Only I knew how hard it was for you to withstand their leers, their taunts, their threats. I knew you cringed with every sound you strained to hear from back in the cells. You prayed you wouldn't hear me scream. I didn't. I remember when we got outside to the parking lot, you stopped and put your hands lightly on my shoulders and avoided my eyes. You gently rubbed the bloody places on my shirt and said, I'll never get these stains out. Damn anyone who thinks that means you were relegated in life to worrying about my ring around the collar. I knew exactly what you meant. It was such an oddly sweet way of saying, or not saying, what you were feeling. Sort of the way I shut down emotionally when I feel scared and hurt and helpless and say funny little things that seem out of context. You drove us home with my head in your lap, all the way, stroking my face. You ran the bath set out my fresh underwear, put me to bed, caressed me carefully, held me gently. Later that night, I woke up and found myself alone in bed. You were drinking at the kitchen table, head in your hands. You were crying. I took you firmly in my arms and held you. And you struggled and hit my chest with your fists because the enemy wasn't there to fight. 
Moments later, you recalled the bruises on my chest and cried even harder, sobbing. It's my fault. I couldn't stop them. I've always wanted to tell you this. In that one moment, I knew you really did understand how I felt in life. Choking on anger, feeling so powerless, unable to protect myself or those I loved most, yet fighting back again and again, unwilling to give up. I didn't have the words to tell you this then. I just said, it'll be okay. It'll be all right. And then we smiled ironically at that. And I took you back to our bedroom and made the best love to you I could, considering the shape I was in. You knew not to try and touch me that night. You just ran your fingers through my hair and cried and cried. When did we get separated in life, sweet warrior woman? We thought we'd won the war of liberation when we embraced the word gay. Then suddenly there were professionals and doctors and lawyers coming out of the woodwork telling us that meetings should be run with Robert's rules of order. We died and left Robert God. They drove us out, made us feel ashamed of how we looked. They said we were male chauvinist pigs, the enemy. It was women's hearts they broke. We were not hard to send away. We went quietly. The plant closed. Something we never could have imagined. That's when I began passing as a man. Strange to be exiled from your own sex to borders that will never be home. You were banished too. To another land with your own sex and yet forcibly apart from the women you loved as much as you tried to love yourself. For more than twenty years, I have lived on this lonely shore, wondering what became of you. Did you wash off your Saturday night makeup in shame? Did you burn in anger when women said, if I wanted a man, I'd be with a real one? Are you turning tricks today? Are you waiting tables or learning Word Perfect 5.1? Are you in a lesbian bar looking out of the corner of your eye for the butchest woman in the room? Do the women there talk about democratic politics and seminars and co-ops? Are you with women who only bleed monthly on their cycles? Or are you married? in another blue-collar town, lying with an unemployed auto worker who is much more like me than they are, listening for the even breathing of your sleeping children. Do you bind his emotional wounds the same way you tried to heal mine? Do you ever think of me in the cool night? I've been writing this letter to you for hours. My ribs hurt bad from a recent beating, you know. I never could have survived this long if I'd never known your love. Yet still, I ache with missing you and needing you so. Only you could melt the stone. Are you ever coming back? The storm is past now. There is a pink glow of light on the horizon outside my window. I'm remembering the nights I fucked you deep and slow until the sky was just this color. I can't think about you anymore. The pain is swallowing me up. I have to put your memory away like a precious sepia photograph. There are still so many things I want to tell you, to share with you. Since I can't mail you this letter, I'll send it to a place where they keep women's memories safe. Maybe someday, passing through this big city, you'll stop and read it. Maybe you won't. 
Good night, my love.